Mr. Grothman. Yeah, just one quick comment for Mr. Zimmerman before I uh, ask him a question. In your testimony, you said higher education has been and remains the single best way for individuals to dramatically improve their socioeconomic status. There's a little bit of snobbery there I don't like. But the point I'll make is, at least in my district and I think around the country, we have a lot of young people taking this stuff to heart. And they wind up graduating from an institution like yours with fifty or sixty thousand dollars in debt. They really do not find a way to move up economically, and they wind up having to go back to a tech school or um, a trade school, which are very wonderful when they're thirty-nine or forty, and their whole life is delayed. And I, I want you to be conscious of this kind of unqualified worship of a, of all forms of secondary education, because I think it is leading a lot of people to a lot of trouble. But I, I will um, ask you a question. In Evergreen University, um, I don't know how many professors you have there, but can you tell me about how many professors you have and how many you think, say, voted for Trump in the last election? Full-time, part-time, we have uh, about 180 probably. I have not a clue of who they voted for. You, you never talk about politics with any of the people hanging around that campus? Uh, I. We certainly talk politics occasionally. I suspect not many of them voted for Trump, but I, I couldn't tell you the... You can't uh, guess. You know, any of your buddies say they voted for Trump and all the times you talk? Uh, there are a couple of people on campus who have, but um, not very many, I suspect. Not very many. Uh, Ms. Strauss, in NYU Law School, I'm going to give you the same question. New York huh? Law School. Uh, again, I'll go, go to surveys that reflect that the overwhelming majority of faculty members are um, Democrats and have given, voted for and given right. money to Democrats. And I think this is a serious problem because when we talk about diversity, it should include ideological diversity as well as other kinds of diversity. And I'm very supportive of a number of initiatives that have been started in the recent past to address this problem, uh, one of which is called the Heterodox Academy, which was spearheaded by Jonathan Haidt, who does teach at uh, NYU. And there's a similar project uh, that's done to get called the Madison Project that's done together by Cornell West, African-American, extremely liberal, some would say radical professor, together with Robert George, a conservative uh, white male Princeton professor. But all of us agree that education suffers when we have uh, too much agreement, too much political orthodoxy right. in any direction. Right. Do, do, how, many, how many professors do you know? I mean, you guys, I assume, unlike uh on the Evergreen, you must talk about who you vote for. How many do you know on a personal level who voted for Trump in, in, in your faculty? I, you know, I didn't actually ask people for whom they voted, but my people educated must talk guess about would be, way. respecting privacy, my educated guess would be extremely few. Uh, Could it be none? Extremely few. But uh, here's something sad. I do know okay. people who privately okay. supported uh, Donald Trump, but are embarrassed to say that they voted for him. Okay, so they're kind of muzzled. Okay, and my question for Mr. Carroll, and I'm sorry what you had to go through the prejudice in our country, but... Um, I landed on my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you believe part of the problem here is it's easy to hate people and demonize people if you don't know any people like that? And maybe one of the reasons why we seem to have difficulty with free speech on college campuses the way you wouldn't have difficulty in other American institutions um, is because some of the faculty members on college campuses, they can spend you know, extensive periods of time without talking to anybody who has political opinions significantly different than their own. Is that part of the problem? Oh, absolutely. And it's I'm, I'm sort of bewildered by it because uh, knowing guys like uh, Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro, knowing them to be great guys, or even sometimes seeing what happens when Dr. Drew says something and the Twitter sphere goes ballistic and what a, talking about what a bad person he is or what have you. Yeah, when you get to know almost anybody, you, you look at them as a person rather than an idea. And we need to look at people as human beings, not ideas or representatives of ideas. And it always helps when you're exposed. I, I personally 
this may sound like a sidebar, but I grew up playing football. I played 10 years of organized football. I played with every different kind of human being, except the Jews, actually, Ben. Females? <laughs> Maybe the holder. Females? Yeah. Yeah, the punter. <laughs> yeah, they cheered. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, so I got exposed to everyone and realized that everyone who came from every different neighborhood was you know, there for one reason, and that was trying to, trying to win a game, and I think it helped a lot in my view view of life. And then later on, when I stepped on a construction site, I got the same thing again. So I do feel like surrounding yourself with uh, diversity in ideas, as well as uh, skin color, is a good thing. Okay, Mr. Shapiro, I'm gonna ask you to follow up on that. I uh, just, you, you hear things in this job, people come up to you, and I do believe there are certainly uh, departments on major American campuses in which you can spend, you know, all day walking up the the hallways where the faculty work and, and never be exposed to anybody who voted for a candidate that about half of half Americans populace did, which is kind of amazing that you find such you know lack of diversity. Oh yeah, and even anywhere. And I, I wondered if one of the reasons for the left's rage is because they sometimes do go to work on college campuses and they don't have any friends who even voted for somebody who about half the American public voted for, which is hard to believe there's anywhere in society that that kind of cloistered, but I, I'm afraid on college camp, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why you have this hatred for, say, people who believe in, you know, more, more conservative half of the American populace. I think you do have some leftist professors who attempt to, you know, be uh, open to other ideas. I mean, Lonnie Guinier was one of my professors at Harvard Law School, and she ended up writing a, a job recommendation for me because we got along so well, and she's very far to the left. But that's, that's more uh, a rarity than it, than it is the, the common thread. I mean, it, even if you put aside President Trump, the fact is that, that I think the polls showed that well under 10% of the, of the faculty at Ivy League schools voted for Romney in 2012. So I mean, the, the, this has been very consistent, and this is why I think you are seeing some of the violence. When I spoke at Cal State LA, you actually saw uh, the professors calling me a member of the KKK uh, before I got there. And so most of the students had no clue who I was, but they were perfectly willing to go out and protest and, and beat people up. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, are, are, are you doing anything? I assume your campus, I mean, Evergreen, it's got a kind of a reputation. Oh. Uh, are, are you we, doing we, anything to? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll get, we got we to move on. I, I, th I thank the gentleman, uh, and I, okay. I apologize. We, we're trying to give everyone a little extra time, but we can't go too much longer. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. 